dear devotees yesterday i recounted for you the leela when akrurji was sent by kans to come into braj and bring krishna and balram to mathura narad ji had gone to kans and revealed the secret to him because it was time narad ji only functions according to shri krishna's desires so narad ji according to the will of shri krishna went to kans and revealed that secret to him that the eighth son of devaki was not only born but was taken by vasudev to braj and is living in the house of nanda baba and yashoda so kans decided to have a multi-pronged plan he sent the demon keshi to go and try to kill shri krishna of course he failed but he also decided that okay we're going to invite krishna and balram for a big event here in mathura we're going to have a big wrestling match and dhanush yagya and we'll invite them to come and view the city of their ancestors and this great kingdom of mine so he made a plan that he would have his best wrestlers like chanur and mushtik they would be there to fight against krishna and balram when they came in and even before they entered the stadium he would have an elephant kuvalaya peer an elephant with as much strength as 1000 ordinary elephants to be waiting at the entrance where shri krishna would come into the coliseum so this whole plan was set in place and he sent akrur ji to go and give the invitation and with a beautiful chariot to bring krishna and balram back so he went he arrived in braj he was received respectfully at the home of nanda and yashoda and served by krishna himself and after he had rested a little bit shri krishna asked him uh, chacha ji there must be some special reason for you to come what is it so he told of kansa's invitation and also of kansa's plan to kill him krishna and balram just looked at each other laughing like ha yeah, that's a good joke okay let's go to mathura and have some fun then and nanda was round up all the gopis and gwalbals and bring all of our best things we're going to go to mathura and see this show because they were all invited as well i told you yesterday about shri krishna leaving the prajwasis and going to mathura we'll have more about that coming up about the state of the prajwasis shri krishna's love for them and their love for him so along the way there was an incident where akrur ji wanted to stop at yamuna to have a holy bath so he got down and while he was in the water he saw krishna in his divine form in the water and he quickly came back and so but i thought these two were sitting on the chariot so he saw oh they are sitting on the chariot so he went back in the water and again he saw them in there he had an amazing divine vision of krishna and balram in their divine form and he gives a long stuti where he's praising the divinity and absolute power of krishna and balram then he came back to the chariot because at one point he was just looking and the form of krishna and balram in the water disappeared so he came back to the chariot and 
Krishna asked him, Uncle, did you see anything interesting when you were in the water? <laughs> oh yes, <laughs> whatever there was to see, I saw it all. <laughs> so they continued to Mathura. And when they reached, well actually along the way, they passed through many small villages. And similar to Ram when he was going out to his Banvas along the way, every little village that they passed, all the residents of that locality would come out and have darshan of Ram and Sita and try to serve them something and talk to them. So the same thing happened with Krishna and Balram as they were going along. At all of these villages, the people felt so fortunate to have the chance to have darshan of Shri Krishna. Because they were getting slowed down by meeting all the people, Nanda Baba and the whole group of Gops and Gwalvals, they reached the outskirts of Mathura first. So they waited there in the, in the forest just outside of Mathura. Krishna and Balram, driven by a Kruji, caught up and reached there. And uh, Sri Krishna said, okay, uh, uncle, now you can go ahead into Mathura and we'll come, we'll rest here and come later. So Kururji said, oh please don't send me alone, I can't be away from you now. Please come with me and come to my house, come and rest a while at my house. So Sri Krishna said, we will come to your house but after accomplishing what I've come to do here in Mathura. So you please go ahead. So Kururji went into the city, went to Kants, told him, I've brought Krishna and Balram and Nanda Baba as you had ordered. And then he went to his house to have some rest. So the whole gang of Brajwasis, they rested there in the forest for some time. And then later in the afternoon, because they left, they left Braj in the morning, and it's only a, not even 10 miles to get to Mathura, so they reached there pretty quickly and then uh, they rested for a while. Later in the afternoon, they decided to head in to see the sights of the city. They were quite amazed seeing all the amazing arches and buildings and gates made of crystal and go golden doorways. Now, seeing the amazing city, Krishna thought, our attire, which is the attire of simple cow herders, it's good for Braj, but here I think we need something more appropriate for the situation. So he went to Kansa's Dhobi, who is washing Kansa's clothes and the clothes of his you know, royal family. He went to that dhobi and he said, uh, could you please provide us some clothes for me and my friends? Um, you know, it'll be in your best interest. <laughs> so that dhobi said, you play in the forest and the mountains and you think you can come here and ask for the clothes of a king? You know what will happen if you do that? The king's men will come and imprison you or kill you. You should be ashamed of yourself. In this way, he was insulting Sri Krishna. So Krishna just took care of him with one smack. And he found the best clothes for himself and Balram. They tried on a few through this here and there. They're all Kansa's clothes. It, that oh yes this is nice this is good so they found the best and whatever was left they gave it to the gualbals and the the gopes so they all dressed up in the best clothes and started going around and touring the city the description is really amazing <clears throat> walls rafters covered in emeralds rubies diamonds sapphires crystal coral pearls, all the best jewels and precious metals, gold and silver and copper. 
the most opulent architecture, even the homes had big pillars in the front with balconies where the residents could sit on top and the town halls and meeting places were very extravagantly built and decorated. Every intersection was plated in gold. It was so decorative, so amazing. But as Sri Krishna and Balaram and their entourage entered the city and started looking around, it was the residents of Mathura who were amazed. They were having darshan of Sri Krishna for the first time. So they lined the rooftops of all the buildings and the street sides. And as Krishna and Balaram walked around the city, looking around, enjoying, everybody was busy having their darshan, drinking in the divine beauty of Krishna and Balaram. Since they were well attired now, they figured though it'd be nice to have a little, even we're here for a festival, so let's get even more decorative. So they went to Kansa's weaver. And the weaver was not like the dhobi. He bowed to Sri Krishna and he very happily got different stripes of colored cloth and sewed them on to their shirt and dhoti and their shawl and everything so that they're very brightly colored now with all these different patterns and stripes. And then they went to the mala maker. His name was Sudama. It's not the same Sudama that Sri Krishna went to school with. So they went to Sudama and he gave them some beautiful flower malas and pearl malas and golden chains and everything to wear. Then they continued around, observing the sights of the city. And they came a, across a young girl with a beautiful face, but who was bent in three places. Her body was bent. Her name was Tribakra or Kubja. So they approached Kubja on the street because she was holding a tray of excellent ointments like chandan paste and that kind of thing, which of course she made for Kants. She was the personal maker of all of these chandan ointments and whatever Kants would use to spread on his body. She made all of those personally for him. So Krishna happened to meet her on the street and said, oh my lady, these are excellent ointments you've made. Can we use those? And she said, well, I'm the personal servant of King Kuns and I make these specially for him, but who is more deserving of it than you? So she gave it to them and they applied it on their body. And to reward her, Sri Krishna came close and he stood so his toes were on top of her toes. So he had her feet anchored down now and using his two fingers like this, he lifted up on her chin and straightened her. So now her hunchback was gone. She was no, she was kubja no more, although we still call her that. She wasn't bent in the back anymore. So at that time, Kubja also invited Krishna, please come to my home. Sri Krishna said, after I take care of what I've come to do here in Mathura, we will also come and visit you in your home. So they went on. They knew that this great dhanush, this great bow, which Kants kept for certain ceremonies and which was going to be used for the ceremony to see, similar to how Ram went to the Swayamvar of Sitaji and they had the bow there to see who could lift it and string it. So Sri Krishna decided, I'm going to go and find out where that bow is. 
So he asked the residents he met and they pointed him in the right way. So he went to this big building where the bow was being kept. And it was well guarded. It was very carefully guarded by many warriors. But Sri Krishna just pushed past them, went in, picked up that bow like it was a piece of sugar cane, strung it and broke it in two, just like Sri Ram had done. And the crack of that bow sounded all over the world. It was heard everywhere. And guns trembled hearing the sound of that. Somebody has broken my bow. So meanwhile, all the guards that they had pushed past, they came and attacked Krishna and Balaram now. So Krishna took one half of the bow, broken bow. Balaram took the other half and they defeated all of those guards just like that. Kant sent a detachment of soldiers to go and find out what had happened. So they also attacked Krishna and Balaram and they defeated all of them. By then, the sun was starting to set and they decided, let's go back to the forest where we had left our carts and we'll rest for the night. So they returned, they went back out there and Krishna and Balaram had a nice peaceful sleep over here on this side in the forest and in his royal palace Kants didn't get a wink of sleep. Krishna and Balaram have come but Krishna has broken the bow and he's going to kill me. What am I going to do? He was thinking of Krishna all the time, the whole night. Everywhere he looked he saw Krishna. He was so fearful of him. He saw Sri Krishna as his death. So in this way the whole night passed. In the morning it was time for the big wrestling festival in this stadium that Kants had, had built just for this purpose. Such a huge stadium. He just gave the order build a stadium and the stadium was built where thousands and thousands of people could come and watch not just from Mathura, but there were invitations sent out. The announcement was made all over the countryside. So that morning the stadium was full and Krishna and Balram and Nanda Baba and all the gops and Gwalbals, they all accompanied them and they made their way towards the stadium. So when they got there, that big elephant was waiting for them. And Sri Krishna said to the keeper of that elephant, you and your elephant move aside. He said, you little boy, who do you think you are? Nobody threatens me and my elephant. So Krishna came and stood in front of the elephant and that elephant, who as I said, was not only huge but had the strength of 1,000 elephants. He grabbed him with his trunk. Krishna just pried his way out and went underneath his feet where he couldn't see him. So then he used his sense of smell to locate Krishna and he grabbed him again with his trunk. But then he again forced his way out. So in this way, Sri Krishna toyed with him like he had toyed with Kaliya Nag and any other demons he may have had to fight. And Kuvalaya appeared in the end was killed by Sri Krishna, little boy of 11 years old. And Kans, who was up in the royal viewing area in the stadium, was not expecting, or at least he was hoping, he wouldn't see Sri Krishna walk through the gates and into the stadium. But after the huge noise of Kuvalya appeared, hitting the ground and dying. Sri Krishna emerged into the stadium. You can imagine everyone there, spellbound by the sight of him. And Kans quaking in fear. Vedavyasji writes, Mallana mashanir nrinam naravara strinam smaro murtiman. 
everyone saw Shri Krishna differently. Everyone who looked at him, Mrityur Bhoja Pater Virad Vidusham. Kans is seeing Krishna as death personified. And he's so fearful. Tattvam param yoginam. The yogis aren't even seeing Krishna in a form. They're seeing, oh, a divine light has entered the stadium. Because they only worship Shri Krishna as that divine jyoti. Vrishni nam svajano satang chiti bhujam. There were some saints there, some divine personalities who knew exactly who Shri Krishna was and they saw him as God. But everyone saw him differently. The wrestlers, Chanur, etc., they saw Shri Krishna like as hard as diamond. Like, look at his body. We have to fight against him? Look at him. And then the Gwalbals who are there, they're saying, Oh, that's our Kanhaya. They're also up in the stands. Oh yeah, Kanha. And Nanda Baba is looking and saying, That's my Koma, Komal Bacha. He's so tender. He's seeing him in a, as a tender little boy and the wrestlers are see him, seeing him as harder than diamond and bigger than they are. And Kuntz is quaking before death personified. And those of a loving heart saw Shri Krishna as being even more handsome than the God of love himself. There were some evil kings there. Shasta Swam. There were some who saw him as a stern ruler, a chastiser of those who would break laws. So they also were a little fearful of him. So everyone saw him in their own way. Jaki Rahi Bhavana Jaisi Prabhu Murati Dekhi Tin Taisi the same thing is described in the Ramayana. When Sri Ram arose and went to pick up Bhagwan Shivji's bow, everyone who was there in the court saw him differently. The demons saw him as a very frightful, in a very frightful form with multiple heads and arms and looking very fearsome. Even the demons couldn't agree. Some saw him with four heads, some saw him with ten, some saw him with fifty. Everyone saw him according to the state of their own mind. Sri Kripaluji Maharaj explains that this never happens with material people, with material bodies. If someone walks in here that we've never seen before, we will at least all agree that the person has two arms, two legs, they have hair or no hair, how tall they are, all of these basic features of their appearance we could agree on. We may have some difference of opinion when it comes to, oh, I think this person is very good looking, oh, I think they're moderately good looking. We can have some difference of, of opinion like that, but we'll agree on the basic form that we're seeing. But with Shri Krishna, because his body is divine, everyone saw him completely differently. And as I said, even the yogis, they didn't see any form at all. They just saw him as a divine light. And if we were there, we would also not have seen him in his actual divine form. Shri Krishna tells Arjuna in the Gita that the people of this world are deluded by the three qualities of Maya, Satvarajtam. Therefore, they are unable to recognize the divinity of my form, even if I'm standing right in front of them. Someone who is 
whose mind is predominantly sattvic may be attracted to me because their heart is more pure, but they won't realize I'm God and they won't experience divine bliss seeing me. They'll see me as a good person. Someone whose mind is predominantly rajas will see me kind of like, oh, this guy looks okay, but I don't know if I trust him kind of a thing. And if someone's mind is more tamas, they'll be repelled by seeing Sri Krishna's divine form. Imagine. So depending upon the purity of one's heart, one experiences the vision of Sri Krishna during his avatar. Of course, when he's not taking avatar, he's an invisible to us. Only a saint can see him. But during his avatar, not only the saints can see him, although the saints can see him everywhere, but we can also see him at that one place where he's revealing himself. So, Veda Vyasji explained that everyone saw him differently because his body is divine. So he entered and everyone was watching what would happen. Those wrestlers, Chanur to Sri Krishna and Mushtik to Balram called them and challenged them. Come and wrestle against us. Kans has told us to wrestle against you and he is our king and he is your king as well. So don't fear. I know the world thinks you're just little boys but we see who you really are. You're as powerful as we are. So come and fight against us. You know what the crowd was thinking? The crowd seeing that they're being challenged by these huge wrestlers, they're think thinking, how can this anyai happen? This is so wrong. These two little boys are going to fight against these big pahalwan? And many within the crowd were getting ready to get up and leave because there's a philosophy of guilt by association, right? You may not have done it, but you were with your friends when they did it. You're still guilty. So if something wrong is happening and you're present and you either don't leave or do something to stop it, then you're as guilty as the one who's having it happen. So many of the people in the crowd, there was a grumbling and mumbling and what's going on and people were getting ready to get up and leave. But then once the fighting started, everybody stopped and watched because Krishna and Balram were throwing around these two wrestlers like nothing. Although it went, the battle went on for some time. But in the end, Charnur and Mushtik, they both tired out and both of them were defeated by Krishna and Balram. And then the other wrestlers, four or five other big wrestlers came and attacked them and they defeated them as well. So seeing that his big elephant had been killed and all his wrestlers had been killed, now Kuntz basically panicked. So he says to his guards, enough is enough. Go and anyone who has supported Vasudev, my father Ugrasen, Krishna, go and round them up and kill them. So kill Ugrasen, my father, kill Vasudev. Get Krishna and Balram and kill them. Get Nanda and all of his gopes and grab all of their stuff, whatever they have, claim it and kill them. So Sri Krishna said, all right, enough is enough. And he pounced up into the stands like a lion pouncing on its prey. And he tossed Kants out into the middle of the Colosseum and jumped on him and that was it. Kuntz was dead. That was the end. But where did Kuntz go? Into Sri Krishna, into his divine abode. Why? I told you, he was thinking of Krishna all the time. 24 hours a day. 
he's walking along and he's trying to get some peace of mind and he sees Krishna standing in front of him. Ah, Yahabi Shri Krishna. He turns around to go the other way. Ah, Yahabi Shri Krishna. His servant brings him his thali with his food. He sees Shri Krishna in the thali and throws the thali. He sees Shri Krishna in his clothes and rips his clothes off. Ah, everywhere he looked, Shri Krishna, Shri Krishna, Shri Krishna. If he were an ordinary person in the world, he would have been hospitalized, right? You're seeing someone everywhere all the time. The doctors would give you some medicine. But here in this case, his mind was attached to Shri Krishna all the time. So he attained Shri Krishna because it doesn't matter. Kamam, Krodham, Bhayam, Sneham. Shukadev Ji had explained to King Parikshit that it doesn't matter kis bhavana se man ka attachment ho jata hai. Bas man ka attachment ho jai, usi ki prapti hoti hai. So it doesn't matter with what type of emotion you attach your mind to someone or something. According to their quality, you are given the result. Their quality. So if you attach your mind to a Thomas person, you get a Thomas result. You'll go to Narak. You attach your mind to a Rajas person, you'll be reborn in this world. You attach your mind to Sattvic Devtas, you'll go to Swarg. Attach your mind to Shri Krishna, you'll go to his divine world. This is a spiritual axiom. So attachment is the key. Whatever you attach your mind to, that's what you attain. But what type of attachment? There are so many different ones, but you can divide them into two categories. Rag and Dvesh. Positive feelings, loving feelings towards someone. And Dvesh means negative feelings, enmity, fear, hatred. Both are attachment. Rag is attachment and Dvesh is attachment. And this is a lesson for us as well. Because in this world, whether we love the world or hate the world, we will attain the world. Whether we love a Thomas person or hate a Thomas person, we will get a Thomas result. That's something to think about. If there's an evil person and you spend all your time thinking about them, this person is so bad, they're so evil, they do this, they do that. You're talking about it with your friends. You're talking about that person with your family. You spend all your time thinking about and talking about that person. Guess what? You're, you've attached your mind to a Thomas individual through repeatedly thinking about them. It doesn't matter that you thought about them with negative feelings. The result is the same. Your mind is attached to that person and now you can't get them out of your mind. They're in your, mi they're in your head, they're in your heart. <laughs> so we do as much chintan of our enemy as we do of our friend. Both are equal in terms of attainment. Kants showed us that. That even though instead of loving Shri Krishna, he feared him, but because of that fear, he thought about him 24 hours a day. Just like the gopis thought of Shri Krishna 24 hours a day, Kans thought of Shri Krishna 24 hours a day, and both attained Shri Krishna. You know, all the ladies in that crowd, when they were seeing Shri Krishna, they praised the gopis. They said, oh, these gopis are so great. They got to have darshan of Shri Krishna and even when they weren't with him. Ya dohane vahanane mathano pale papre khinkhanar bharudito chanamarjana dau gayanti chaina manurak Dhyo Shrukantyo 
धन्या व्रजस्त्रिय उरुक्रम चित्तयाना धन्या are these gopis of Raj whose mind was absorbed in Shri Krishna all the time, 24 hours a day. When they were doing their work, when they were churning the curd, when they were feeding their babies, when they were tending the cows, milking the cows, no matter what, when they were cooking, no matter what they were doing, they were all Gayanti Chaina Manurakta Dhyo Shrukanthyo. They're always singing Shri Krishna's leelas, name, gunas, and with tears and their voice choked up in love for him, they pass their day thinking of him all the time while doing their duties. The gopis are the supreme karma yogis. They spend all day every day doing their duties and thinking of when will I get the next little glimpse of Shri Krishna. Just a glimpse as he's walking by at the end of the day after grazing the cows. How selfless is the love of the gopis. They never demanded Shri Krishna's association. They just gave their hearts to him and remembered him all the time. So these ladies of Mathura were singing the praises of the gopis. So whereas the gopis had their minds in Shri Krishna with love 24 hours a day, Kants Mamaji had his mind in Shri Krishna 24 hours a day out of fear, but both attained Shri Krishna. The lesson for us is when it comes to worldly attachment, whether it's love or hate, the result is the same. We attain whatever we have attached our mind to. And in terms of devotion, we're meant to emulate the gopis, not kants. That type of love for Shri Krishna out of fear or out of hatred like Shishupal or out of anger like Ravan and Kants did, that type of devotion to Shri Krishna with the so-called negative emotions, that is only possible during his avatar. It's not to be it's not to be practiced like okay souls of the world <laughs> just think of Shri Krishna out of fear 24 hours a day no that's not a recommended path of devotion the souls have to do devotion with anukul chintan anya shunyam gyan karmadyanavritam Anukulyena Krishna Nushilanam Bhakti Ruttama. Rup Goswami says, Anukul uh, Krishna Nushilanam. We have to attach our mind to Shri Krishna, love him with feelings of loving relationship like Sakya Bhav, Dasya Bhav, Vatsalya Bhav, Madhuri Bhav. But with positive feelings, not with negative feelings. So in this way, Shri Krishna finally killed Kants. So now there was a big rejoicing. All the people in Shri, all the Yadus, part of Shri Krishna's lineage who had been banished and harassed by Kant's re word spread very quickly and they started flocking to Mathura. Ugrasen was released. Of course, Shri Krishna personally went, Krishna and Balaram personally went and released Vasudev and Devaki from Kant's jail. And when Vasudev and Devaki saw Shri Krishna and Balaram, they realized who they were, that they're God. So they didn't embrace their sons. They stood there like this, without saying anything and keeping their distance. So Shri Krishna said, this is a problem. We're going to have to change this. So what he did, you can come and hear about tomorrow.
बोलिए वृंदावन बिहारी लाल की जय